All right, Luke, uh, I'm excited to talk to you. So I'm working on a book right now on ethics, but it's wider than ethics, or at least it's not confined to kind of the traditional you know, topics that come under ethics. And one of the sections I have in there that I think is really crucial to being able to achieve and enjoy happiness is making art part of your life. And I've told the story in various places, but I don't think on this show, which is um, the one of the areas where I did not have a clue how to appreciate them until, uh, I mean, I guess my early mid twenties was the visual arts. So, you know, reading a novel, listening to music, um, there's kind of, it, it, it was, uh, totally accessible, right? Like there's ways that you can kind of deepen your enjoyment of them, but that kind of surface level getting enraptured by the story or by the song, you know, that's kind of something that is, it doesn't take a lot of cultivation to get there. And it's something that we're taught to cultivate, you know, when we're, when we're young and our parents read to us and they play music for us and so on, but the visual arts, you know, I, they kind of like emotionally left me pretty cold. Like I'd go, Oh, that looks nice. And, you know, went, to the Louvre and went to all these places. And it was more like visiting a history museum. Like, oh, that's really old. Oh my gosh, Da Vinci touched that, or I've seen that on TV. But it wasn't an emotional experience, certainly not an aesthetically emotional experience. And um, then in, what I guess it was 2008, 2009, uh, we were both at a conference together in Boston and you hosted a uh, an art tour. I think it was one of your first that you had ever done. And I walk in with a group of people. I think there was like eight of us, 10 of us. And I'm expecting, you know, something like, Hey, this is, this pic painting is titled X, Y, Z. Isn't it awesome? This is what the artist was trying to express. Isn't that cool? But it was completely different. And I'm not going to go into it in great detail. Cause I think we'll do that during the course of this podcast, but I just remember walking out of there and it was like a, an aesthetic experience as intense of, as any novel I had read and uh, any song that I had listened to. And so first of all, thanks for that. And uh, second, so that's, you know, when I went to write this section of my book, I wanted to describe that experience. And thankfully you have done the hard work of not just helping people have these experiences when, Luke Travers is walking them through a museum, but giving them the tools to do it on their own. So um, why don't we take a step back though, and just uh, a little in your background, how did you get interested in art and in teaching people how to enjoy it? Oh, those are two, um, two great questions to start with. Uh, and uh, the first one I'm going to, um, to, how did I get interested in art? That was, from the inspiration of one particular individual, um, a friend of mine, Lee Sandstead. And I started off as a philosophy major and got two and a half, three years into the program and dropped out. Um, and I took a trip with my buddy Lee, who was into art history. He just changed his major from journalism to art history um, and was going to pursue a master's in that. And we, we took a trip to Europe and we went to see all the museums, the Louvre, the um, uh, we went to Florence, um, uh, went to Rome and saw, saw the, the major things. Now, at that point in time, I was fascinated by art history because I, I saw it as a continuation of my studies of philosophy. I was going to these different time periods, the Renaissance, the 19th century, and I was seeing uh, these artworks as a concretization of the ideas of the time period. And so I got into art history and I credit my friend Lee for, for getting me into the arts in the first place. Well, let me just say a word about that because I actually saw Lee speak when I was in college and I forget even how it came about. I think somebody in the Richmond area put it together and uh, he put up two images. One was, they were both Pietas. One was Michelangelo's and the other was William Bougaro's. And at first you know, he asks us what our reaction is. And then he goes on his own kind of analysis where by the end of it, you, the audience are having quite a different reaction 
uh, particularly to Michelangelo's where at first you're like, Oh, this is gorgeous. And it is gorgeous. And he, he doesn't diminish it as, as a work, as a masterpiece, but in terms of what it was communicating, it didn't, it wasn't as up. It, it was definitely not uplifting when you saw it and learned how to see it. And so that, that was a powerful experience. The difference um, was that I didn't know how to do that uh, after I walked out of Lee. I, he inspired me, gave me this powerful experience, but I didn't yet. It, it felt like, oh, if I was an art major, maybe I could learn to understand art on that level. But he, but it was an incredible lecture. And he, in, uh, I, I, I only met him that once, but he was a, um, just a fantastic one of those people who walks into a room and the energy level of the room goes from like a two to a 10. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I, I, I'm glad you brought up that uh, talk because I, I was actually just thinking about that this morning, that particular lecture that he gave, because I was trying to think of, yeah, you know, you have your origin story for your deeper appreciation for the arts when you went to Boston and on that tour. And I was trying to think of what's, what's my origin story, because the first story I think of is, when I first saw when I saw Michelangelo's David after I'd studied him for a long time and I was disappointed. And it's a story I tell in, in the Touching the Art book where I I appreciated it as art history. And then after a few moments of being odd, oh, wow, this is Michelangelo's David D. David, 17 feet tall out of one piece of Carrara marble. And then I asked myself, oh, what do I do now? And my instinct had always been the meaning is going to come from the art history text that I'm going to read a lot like your story about the approach you were expecting I was going to take when you were at the tour that day. And I found that a lot of people have that expectation of gaining meaning out of the arts by going to the history text. Um, now, I was trying to think, okay, where yeah, it, there wasn't one particular moment for me where I started to say, aha, now I approach art differently, but it was a kind of culmination little moments. And that lecture that Lee gave on the two pietas, the two Mary's with the body of Jesus was one of those because I remember the question he asked at the beginning. He asked the question, which one is the secular one and which one is the religious one? And you have the Michelangelo one. And I'm first, everybody's first answer is the Michelangelo one because it's just Mary and Jesus and, and Michelangelo is Renaissance. And then you have the other one by William Bugro and it's filled with angels filled with angels. So the natural instinct is to say, yeah, the one with all the angels, that's the <laughs> mystical one. But then he took us up through a process of, of reading more closely the body language and seeing what was the story that was being communicated through the body language of the two Marys. In the Michelangelo one, Mary is, is accepting the fate of Jesus being, uh, being dead and being, being sacrificed, and she's offering him to us. Her hands are open, her eyes are cast down. In the Bougro version, you see a very different Mary. She's clutching the body of Jesus, her arms clasped, her, her one hand clasping her wrist as she holds him tightly to her chest, to her heart. And she stares kind of at us and slightly upward towards God with these red, sad and angry eyes. And which one is the more mystical and which one is the more, um, the more passionate, this earthly? He convinced me it was the Bougaro Mary who cared about her son, whom she just lost, and she was not sacrificing anything. So that there was a, a culmination of these moments, and I, I'll and and there, there are several lectures by Lee and several presentations by Lee that gave me a sense of let me find some meaning that's in the artwork. And I, a little bit like you, Don, I kind of struggled with how to do that um, uh, because I, I think I, I got it from Lee, and and I remember also. Diane Durante um, gave another great kind of comparison between two Nathan Hale statues where he's in the moment where he's uh, uh, about to be executed. And in one of them, he looks odd and kind of frightened. And the other one, he looks um, defiant. And that, that's another example of this. Oh, there's a story here. And I can more clearly see it by this contrast. But I never... I, I, ne I felt like, oh, I had to do research to find comparisons or something to get myself into it. And then so I was continuously dissatisfied with my experiences with the art because I, it felt like I always had to do more research. I could never approach an artwork and then immediately get into it. And, and like I'm picking up a, a novel or like turning on Netflix and, and watching, you know, Ted Lasso or Succession or something. Right. Um, so the thing that I started to think to do was to ask myself, 
what do I do with my mind, with my awareness when I'm reading a novel and when I'm watching a movie that I could then apply to the visual arts? And so a couple of things came from that. Um, the first one was to realize, and the key one was to realize that the thing I was not doing with the visual arts was suspending disbelief. I was not imagining this as a story that was really happening. I was imagining it as an artifact that represented something, a concretization of philosophy. But when I go to a movie, I just saw Dune a few nights ago. I lay back, I let the story sweep over me. And for two and a half hours, those characters are real. That's happening. And that's not the attitude that I would have with visual arts. And I, I noticed in my niece, there's a story I tell in the Touching the Art book of her coming upon a statue and I'm freaking out because she's climbing all over the statue. And then it's, I realize, okay, it's outdoors at a zoo. So I'll, you know, I'll stop freaking out. And uh, I see the statue and my art history brain goes in overdrive. And I think, okay, 20th century. Oh, it's a kind of realistic. It's bronze. I wonder what realistic art or artists are working these days. And what she does is she sits in a little girl's lap. Who's the statue. And in that little girl's lap, there's a cat made of bronze. And my little niece sits in the girl's lap and starts to pet the cat. And so for her, she was not touching bronze. She was imagining that she was touching the fur of the cat as she's making a new friend. She was suspending disbelief. And that's something that I started realizing. If I start to approach the visual arts that way, that can fundamentally change my attitude. Now, that was well, the first step. Yeah. I just want to say something about that, because I think you still agree that like art is a concretization of philosophy but i think the point is that um that doesn't tell that's sort of like the understanding the underlying dynamics of why we have kind of the emotional reactions that we do to art but when you're actually in the moment you're not focused on an academic exercise at least not mm -hmm. at the beginning you're focused on stepping into this world the artist has created and it's sort of like um I mean, it's sort of like if for most of my fans are also fans of Ayn Rand, um, her view of sex, which is that it's a celebration of the self and of life or the benevolent universe premise. But her point is not that like you should be sleeping with someone thinking, oh, what a benevolent universe this is. No, you're in the moment. You're there. And it's only when we're stepping back and going, why was this such an intense pleasure that we have these kind of deeper explanations. And I think I, I certainly was doing what you were doing, which is I came to art through a philosophic lens and that made it harder at the beginning to kind of get the emotion out of it. And uh, yeah. Uh, and I like the way you're, you're placing the, uh, the metaphysical evaluation or metaphysical experience of the art. You've got to experience the art first. And then uh, upon reflection, think back, okay, what was the philosophical meaning of this in the, in the culture or to my life? And that gets to kind of the second part of appreciating art that I was realizing that I wasn't doing that, that, that gets you into the experience. And the analogy I like to use here is with literature. And with literature, you, first you got to know how to read, but then while you're reading a novel, to complete the experience, to live in it, to make it come to life, the onus is on you to provide the mental images to go along with the concretes. So when you're reading Victor Hugo or Ayn Rand or uh, any other novel out there, you have a description of the character, of the setting, of the action. And the more you picture that in your mind's eye, the more you feel, you feel the experience of being in that world. Now with the visual arts, I kind of see it as the reverse. You're provided with the images, but you're not provided with the concepts. And to fill that experience, you provide the words. And so that's where this idea of reading an artwork has developed from. So how am I going to experience more? I'm not just gonna simply look at it. I'm not just gonna simply talk about the uh, stylistic elements. I'm not just gonna simply feel, I'm going to read the artwork. And I use that word rather than say describe because describe can be a little bit um, bland. Reading suggests that you're looking for the story and you're putting together the story. And that means that you're kind of imagining this as, a, as something that's really happening and you're suspending disbelief. How, so 
I mean, that leads, I think, to a question, which is like, how can one snapshot, one, you know, frame, one instant of time tell a story? Yeah, I like that question a lot. Um, and I, I'm going to come up with a, a really strange analogy for this. <laughs> Rubbernecking. When you are going down the highway and you see the, the lights of the cop cars uh, coming up and you're going to want to know, okay, what just happened? Uh, is everybody okay? Was it a car crash? Is it something minor? Is it something important? And as you're quickly glancing, just a quick glance as you drive by, you're picking up a lot of details that then you're processing in your mind. Oh, it looks like the car swerved off the road and hit this other one, um, but it didn't look like it did too much damage. So it seems like it's a, just a formality and it's okay. That kind of instant moment is something that's captured in the visual arts. And in an instant moment, there is so much that is implied, both about what went on before, what's going to happen later on, and about, most importantly, the emotional state of mind of the characters in the particular situation that they're in. And I kind of see this kind of frozen moment as actually a very, very powerful part of the visual arts because it invites you in your life to look at your life in terms of what's happening to me right now. And there's so much in our life that just keeps going. The flood of life just happens. But if you can freeze time and say, what is the painting here? What's happening in this moment? What am I about to experience? What am I experiencing? Then you can be, what's that term? Mindfulness. Then you can be more mindful of where you are in life and what it means to you right now. And I see the visual arts as this is, this is an important moment. One of the interesting things is that, you know, you talk about sort of um, kind of going through this process to step into that story and, and so on. And if you think about the difference between like, you know, watching a movie or reading a novel, the, it's not just that kind of the picture plays in your head in a more uh, automatic way, but I think it's more natural that we kind of step into empathizing with the protagonist or whomever and becoming emotionally invested in that moment in a way where it sounds like, you know, if I'm looking at, um, you know, a painting, I have to kind of purposefully put myself there and yeah. so how do you think about that? Um, I mean, maybe you just kind of want to go through a little bit more through your overall process, because I know one of the things that you do when you kind of give people a template for like, these are the kinds of questions to ask yourself. You have a lot of questions that from different in different ways, try to like prompt that prompt a person to put yourself, you know, in this particular scene or what's this, what's something like this that you've experienced? Yeah, and I. I think I agree with you that um, it's easier to do that when you're watching a movie or you're reading a novel because you're really getting to know the characters and, and the scene is more fleshed out and the stakes are more fleshed out and you know more fully what's going on, but you're not presented with all that information when you're looking at the painting. So you, you've got to do more work, I think, to to do that, uh, to, to step into the shoes. and. And I think it's something that um, that almost comes naturally when you're watching um, a movie that that speaks to you, or you read a novel that speaks to you. You you know you've got the big blast blockbuster stuff, but then I, I was realizing when I was watching Dune, you know, this would have been even better if I were you know back when I was 15 or 16, and I could resonate the the character of the the main character Timothy Chalamet. Sh Chalamet, Chalamet plays resonates with me more because he's like a 15 year old, but now is kind of more identifying with his dad a little bit more, but um, it, it, it feels more natural. So you do have to do some kind of work with the visual arts and that goes with kind of providing the words and then asking yourself particular questions to get to the meaning. And, um, and it, it is, there is one particular concept that I really like when I am looking at a work of art, and that's to try to identify the situation that character is going through. And I ask myself, I can't kind of think of it, if they were to give me a call, the character did, and say, hey, Luke, here's what happened to me yesterday. 
I was about to be executed and the guard put up my last meal in front of me. And so I was about to have my final meal. And then I'm presented with that situation. Now, I'm not going to identify with that particular situation. I've never been in the precipice of being executed. But because this character is my friend, I'm going to do my best to empathize with his situation. So then I'm going to think about, all right, how can I empathize with a moment where there's doom awaiting me and I am going to be trying to have one last moment of living? And maybe, you know what, I've, I've had to leave jobs before or relationships. And maybe there's, there's that the final moments where I know it's going to, that's, that end is going to come about, a sad ending maybe, a tragic ending maybe. It's on a smaller scale, but I'm going to use whatever my life experience is there to connect to the character and to make me care for their situation even more. And it's at that moment that if I do a little bit of thinking and introspection that I can then that I can then see myself in the character and care about the outcome of what's happening to him. So I I have certainly found that you can learn so much just by reading a painting and reading a sculpture um, and I think towards the end, maybe we can walk through an example because it's it's a little hard to articulate in yeah. the abstract. Um, and like that's really powerful. But what do you see as the role for research? Because I remember, here's just one example. Um, we were at the Getty uh, some years ago and you took us through a painting um, that was, it, it, you got us to that emotional place, but there was a turning point where kind of the ante went up a little bit more when you explained all right, there was such a thing as a tulip bubble, uh, in, I think in the 18th century. And this is, you know, from that era. And so um, getting, it gave us more of the situation as the artist saw it. Yeah. And, um, and then there's, this is somewhat related, but, you know, in art history, there's certain tropes or symbolism that's sort of standard, particularly if you think about religion and so on, where it's, it, to somebody who was, you know, in the 16th century, it would have ha it had obvious meaning to them that, oh, this is the kind of situation we're facing. Whereas to somebody who's, you know, in a secular 21st mm -hmm. century um, world, you wouldn't get that unless you knew either more of the history or at least art history where these things become, you see, oh, this is a t like even the Pieta. This is, uh, now that's kind of obvious looking at it, what it is, but it, you still know, oh, this is part of a, a, a kind of painting, which there were many, and um, it had a certain kind of standardized on, uh, content to it. So what do you see as sort of um, the benefits of research? Yeah, that's a great question. And uh, I, I see different purposes for, for research. And the, the kind of, there's a certain kind of research that would go into helping you read the story of the artwork. That's um, background knowledge that would be assumed by the author. And um, so I don't know. I, I heard something, you know, if you take the novel Atlas Shrugged, for example, it's all about trains. I heard somebody say once that if you, 200 years in the future, you might have to explain to somebody the way trains worked and how important they were for the economy of the country in order to appreciate the story of Atlas Shrugged. And with a lot of the art that I spent time with, you, um, I'm going back 200, 300 years. So you talked about this tulip bubble painting that I love. Uh, and it's actually one I'm featuring on the, on the Kickstarter page for the, for the book. If, but um, it's something that yeah, if you would know it at the time period, if you're looking at this artwork, but you don't know it now. So there's that kind of research. It gives you essential background to appreciating what's happening in the story of the painting in that particular moment in the character situation. And then there's another kind of research that you can do that will give you more of an appreciation of what makes this artwork distinctive in time. And that would be the one kind of looking at the tropes. So if you if you wanted to appreciate more of what makes Michelangelo's David distinctive, then you would look at all the other Davids that were done before and see, oh, they were all clothed or they were all depicted as young boys uh, and so forth. And then you'd see, oh, you know, monumental nude. And that would be a separate kind of appreciation. That would be maybe a little bit more going towards the 
the uh, the historical or philosophical significance of the artwork at that point, because then you could say Michelangelo wanted to present man as a heroic being. And what he did was he pre presented not a boy, but a strong young man and depicted all the, his beauty in this uh, in this and his nudity. So and that I love that kind of research. I spent years doing that kind of research, but it's the kind of research that um, I would do, as you mentioned, after I have the experience of the story. Now, the if it's if it's elemental, if the, if those um, there's some background history that's elemental to understanding what is happening in the story, then I want to make sure to incorporate that. I want I wanted to ask you about a couple of different cases where um, it's less obvious how these con these concepts apply. So. Uh, well, let me start with this one. How do you see just kind of the more formal elements of art fitting in? Because I'll, I'll tell you, I absolutely love Van Gogh. Mm -hmm. I I just I could, uh, but it's not not for the story, not even not even not for kind of like his <laughs> uplifting scenes or something like that, but just his pure way of bringing alive the world through color. Yeah. I I it, it, I find it really elevating. And um, do you think that, would you look at something like that the same way? Or how, how do you approach something that maybe doesn't have a particularly fascinating story? Or maybe you think it does, and, I'm, and, and that very well could be, and I'm totally missing it. Um, but that seems to be more stressing uh, the kind of, um, the more straightforward visual elements. And uh, I like Van Gogh as an example. And I... Uh... And I would I would say it's stressing the visual elements, but also when you're stressing the visual elements, there is a lot of emotional power there. When I did see the David for that first time, I was awed. Wow, it's huge. It's amazing. And I, I know that feeling of Van Gogh's. I, I like Van Gogh's a lot. And especially when you you, you the, the, the how striking those colors are, how saturated and intense and you feel like you're walking into this imaginary world of his. And that's that's there. Um, there are other artists that are like that, that I feel like I'm entering into their domain. Caspar David Friedrich, a landscape painter who, who does these really dramatic scenes. Or um, Maxfield Parrish, uh, who, who everything is kind of sunlit. But there, I, I like that feeling. and I want that feeling. And that's a part of it. Art is visual. And what we've been talking about is how to get into the story of the artwork. But the first world that you see is a, a visual world. Um, and I, you, you, I let that sweep over me. And often when I'm in a gallery and I'm going through, what I do is when I step into a gallery, I glance around and let and, and respond visually uh, and emotionally to what I'm seeing, to let the artwork hit over me. Hit, and then I decide, okay, this one intrigues me or this one um, I'm attracted to. And I, I have my tendencies to, I go, I go more for kind of the uh, strong contrast of light and dark, the intensely dramatic lighting type of images. And I know I'm drawn to that and I really like that. And that is absolutely valid and absolutely part of your experience. Um, and that, that, would be the, that would be the one thing I'd rely upon um, early on. And then I'd go to the art history text after that. In fact, another Lee, Sandstead story. Um, he, I remember his bedroom. I because I, I, he won't mind me saying this. I moved in to his basement. It was like a shared house when I moved out of my parents' home when I was seventeen. And um, I, that, it's that that fits very well with my advice, which is live with your mentors for a while. You will learn. You, you, will, <laughs> you will get a great education. Um, well, his bedroom was was filled with with art. Just filled. And I remember the moment when I um, walked into his bedroom and his bedroom door closed. And on the on the inside uh, door, there was this Bouguereau painting of the birth of Venus. And there was a streak of light that my eye was drawn to. It's like, wow, what a beautiful, beautiful streak of light. And so that was one of my first experiences where I was, it was one of the first Bouguereau paintings, William Bouguereau paintings that I've ever seen. But that was one of my first experiences where I was like, wow, that, the art can be visually powerful and can do something to me. Because I'd been used to a lot of you know, modernist art uh, that, that had shapes and certain things and I realist art that looked okay, but never seen that kind of visual power that you're seeing in Van Gogh. And 
And so there, that, that, that is there, that is definitely there. And I think to just simply put it as it's, it's visual is not enough because there's, there's a lot of emotion that's there in the world that's created by the artist and also in your personal response and what it is that you're drawn to. And when you're just walking around with people or meeting people um, at a party or something, you get that first impression of them and the way they carry themselves and what they wear and their appearance and their, and, and their, uh, just their standard facial expression. And you make snap judgments. You say, Oh, they look friendly or wow, he's arrogant or, oh, that looks like uh, a person I'd like to spend time with. And I say, go with those snap judgments and unpack it later on, but go with those. They're so powerful and important. So then um, one of the early uh, art experiences, I remember this is before you, before Lee, is I went to uh, the Washington DC National Gallery and I just remember having the reaction of portrait after portrait after portrait. And in my mind, it stood as, okay, basically I'm looking at like a whole bunch of Polaroids before they had cameras. Uh, can I go home now? Yeah. I, have a, I have a different <laughs> view. It, the portraits still aren't my favorite, but I have a different view. But why don't you kind of explain like, what is a portrait doing that might be different from, um, you know, something that's more obviously kind of, hitting you with story whether yeah. it's something like you know the birth of venus or um or, or even like a van gogh where it's you know he's he he's doing something like big and bold in front of you and you know mm -hmm. it whereas you know somebody in a uh 18th century suit uh just staring ahead that does not seem obviously <laughs> like even the same phenomenon oh uh, i like that question so um yeah, Van Gogh, you're entering into his vision of the, what the world is. The birth of Venus or Michelangelo's David, you are, um, you have a story, a moment from a story that's playing out in front of you. And then a portrait, <laughs> what is it? 18th century person just staring back and they all look alike. Um, so I, I kind of agree. I kind of agree. A lot of portraits, they all look alike because they're just they're not picked out to show a variety of different kinds of people and a different kinds of uh, uh, personalities. But what I look for in, in portraits, ideally, and in my book, there are several portraits. It's I look for who is this person fundamentally? So not in a particular situation, a particular moment and how they're reacting to that particular moment. Uh, like my friend who called me up from his jail cell and said, I'm, I'm having my last meal. I, his voice sounded, his voice sounded like he was angry at the world at the moment, but that's not who he is every day and how he's been throughout his life. So portrait captures the character of a person as they stand, as they normally are, yeah, who is this kind of person. And, um, and I like, I like to play games with portraits. Um, I was in Austin. I gave a tour at the Blanton Museum of Art recently, and there was one room filled with portraits. And there's one in particular I liked of a young woman. And um, there are a lot of other portraits of young men in the room. So the game we played was to find her a date <laughs> uh, to see which one of these other gentlemen would best match her. And we had competing theories about, okay, what would be a good match? Is it somebody that's gonna have the same personality as her? Is it somebody that's gonna uh, compliment her personality? Who would be somebody like she'd get along with? And so what I'm doing is I'm drawing on my, my real life interactions with people, my, my knowledge of people, uh, my personal concerns, relationships and all that. And I'm, I want to see the portraits as people as people with lives, with careers, with families, with love interests, and ask myself, what kind of person is this? What would they want in their life? What do they think about um, society? What do they think about family? What do they think about the date that they go on on? Would they swipe right on Tinder or swipe left? Yeah. Well, and so I, I said that it's not my current view. Um, I, it's still uh, not my favorite, but it's very valuable to somebody who's writing novels. Um, so, you know, I just had my first novel come out today, although it'll be quite, it'll be a week past there by the time everybody sees this. But it's, you're trying to capture, you, you're 
if when you describe somebody physically as a novelist, you want it to be more than just, hey, I'm randomly describing, you know, somebody's haircut and mm -hmm. skin color. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You want to evoke who they are. Or if you're writing a mystery like I am, you might want to kind of evoke not who they are, but you want to have a deeper meaning uh, connected to these kind of physical characteristics of how somebody dress, how they hold their posture, yeah. you know, where they look when you're talking to them, all of those things. And I think portraits, like it's such an incredible feat to be able to reveal a whole character through a still of somebody's face or their, you know, maybe their whole body. And uh, so understanding how a visual artist does that, I found is really fruitful for me as somebody trying to kind of reverse the process. No, that's, that's, I, I love that point um, because I bet in part of your preparations you're for, for your characters, you're, you're jotting all the things down that's funnily about them that's going to be like a guide for, for how they're going to react to different situations. Um, I'll give you, Don, I'll give you a, one suggestion for approaching portraits in, in the museum that I found really valuable, not just for enjoying the portraits, but then for enjoying people much more afterwards. And that is to find, look around, glance around. You might have to go to a few different rooms, galleries, find two portraits of similar um, age, gender um, people, but have very different personalities. And then if they're far apart, you know, take your phone and take a photo of one and bring it over to the other and look at them side by side and go through each of their features and contrast them. So you have an idea, maybe one of them is, oh, she looks like she's really outgoing. This one, she looks like she's really shy. And then go through each of the features, how they're different. What are the eyes doing differently? Oh, her eyes are cast down. Hers are staring straight at you. Uh, or, or what about the mouth? Oh, this one has kind of pursed her lips a little bit. This one is in a broad smile. Uh, the shoulders and the hair arrangement, the, um, the way she's holding her hands, all these details go through and compare the two. And you'll see more vividly the striking contrast between these two different kinds of people, kind of like uh, with the Pietas or the Nathan Hales. And then afterwards, what I found personally, if I, if I spend 20 minutes doing this, I, I turn around and I start looking at the people walking by in the museum and suddenly their soul on, becomes so much more apparent on their face. Their features speak to me so much more about who they are. I see them more clearly. I, I don't know what the psycho, psychology there is, but I'm priming my mind to notice these details and the details pop out more instantaneously revealing more of who they are so one more uh landscapes so now all right we've stripped away uh, a, an obvious story we've stripped away people and now we're left with you know nothing um I i'm exaggerating obviously but uh so when you think about like landscapes or even still lives um how what's uh what are we? What kind of stories are we actually seeing there, in the best cases? Oh, it's interesting. You, you group landscapes and still lives together. I might separate the two out, and I'll explain why. Um, so first, you talked about Van Gogh, who does a lot of landscapes, and you have that that immediate visceral reaction to the to his view of the world. And if we're looking at a landscape in terms of the story it tells, what I think of is like an establishing shot in a movie, where you see the scene of the battlefield after the battle, and then you come across the figures who are left behind wounded, or you're seeing the, the field of flowers. And then suddenly after the, the camera pans a little bit, there are the two lovers running through the field. But that what I see is the landscape is the setting of a mood for a potential story. So the kinds of things I ask myself, I, I, I want to get into the mood. That's kind of the abstraction I get to. I want to get into the, what kind of mood is this showing me? And then to kind of accentuate that, I ask myself, what, what kind of story could I potentially be seeing here? What would I be doing if I were in this place? Would I be having a picnic? Would I be going on an adventure? Would I be Indiana Jones? Would I be, uh, you know, hiding from the potential monsters that could come out of the, uh, uh, from behind those trees? So that gets me into 
what the landscape shows, which is this this mood, but also it, it I, I get more out of the mood by imagining kind of the possible stories. Well, I like that. And I mean, for me, I just think of, you know, I think one of the most powerful, like couple seconds of film, if you remember, uh, once you get past the opening uh, scene of Saving Private Ryan, where they're at the graveyard, but they go back now to Normandy. And the first shot is, as I recall, it's just a beach, water mm. washing up on sand. It's like peaceful, everyday experience, you know, a place where you just walk along and, you know, have kids fritter in. And then now it's the beach and the contrast to, you know, the most horrific battle you've ever seen. So it's, it, it, um, I think there's just a lot built into that contrast because yeah. it's yeah. not the scene you would set there, right? Yeah. It's it's yeah. not what's suggested by this. And yeah. I think you're supposed to get that, like, yeah. no, th this is not the usual. This is the, and it's, uh, it, it's taking the earth and doing something to it. That's, you know, horrific um, in a way that uh, it, just elevates how striking it is but i like the idea of an establishing shot um because that really drives home that scenes just naturally evoke meaning for us but you have to pause on it uh and notice it because most people aren't thinking about that contrast in saving private ryan but it's there emotionally kind of yeah. automatically um and the director notices and knows what he can do with that power and that information. No, I, I love that point. And as you're talking, I'm being reminded of um, when I took some students to, to Normandy and there's a photo that, uh, that we took um, where, where my friend and the other chaperone, Elizabeth and I were just sitting back um, and watching the kids play on, on the beach, um, Omaha beach, and just taking that photo and seeing them like throw a football around and knowing that we just spent time at the cemetery and what had happened there a while ago. Yeah. So the building of the contrast by having you expect certain things from the setting and then ripping apart by presenting you the gunfire in that beach and the, the death. Yeah. So uh, we have about 15 minutes plus or minus left. Uh, so I wondered if maybe you could kind of walk through an example and just kind of give us and, and, Hey, me, free tour. Uh, yeah. An example of how you approach reading a painting. So I'd be more than happy to, Don. And um, I'll give you, tell you what, I've got, I've got an artwork for you. And I don't think it's one you've seen before. Um, and what I'm going to propose is it's, it's, a, it's an artwork from the book. So the book is set up for upcoming books, stories, and paint. And the book is set up so that there are some guiding questions for you to initiate your reading of the artwork. And then there's my reading of the artwork that kind of answers a bit of those questions. And, um, and I've been thinking a little bit about it and it's kind of like the, uh, I guess the reverse of illustrating a novel. So in the 19th century, you, you would have like the hunchback of Notre Dame and you could get like a, a version where the, you know, every chapter had this magnificent illustration. So this, this is you, you have the artwork and then the illustration quote unquote is, is my reading. Um, but of course, uh, I hope that the book provides the inspiration for you to create your own readings of the artworks. So I invite you to, to answer the questions as we go through, we'll have a little bit of discussion and then I'll share my reading. Let's go for it. Um, and the first question I'm going to ask you once I show this is to give the artwork your own initial title. This is an activity that I really like to do is just right off the bat, what are the first words that come to mind when you're seeing this? So tapping into that emotional, that emo immediate emotion, that first impression and giving it words. And what giving it words does is it immediately starts, let, lends you to start reading the artwork to start looking for the story in the artwork. So let me share my screen with you. And do you see it done? Yes. What's your initial title? Uh, let's see. I'm, my vocabulary is escaping me. I, I mean, it would, it, let's say something like, uh,
pleasing, happy event. Great, wonderful, happy event. And what's embedded in that initial title, Don, are kind of questions that you can then follow through. Like, what makes this look happy? And and this is actually a really, really dark painting, isn't it? Uh, well, that's what I was going to say, like happy yeah. afternoon. I was going to place it in a time of day, yeah. but you don't have that. You have this. Yeah, but there's something dark that draws you to, to the word happy. So we're going to look more for that. And then event. And you're, that's interesting. You said it's an event. And so what kind of event? What's going on? And so the first question I have for you, Don, is, um, well, what is going on? Who, well, so, I, yeah. So this is just kind of my knee jerk reaction, but so for people who can't see it we'll, and we'll, we'll put a link in the show notes um, so that you guys can look at this. And I'm sure at the end, Luke will tell us the title, but he doesn't want to bias us right now. So it, you can't Google it quite this second, but if you're, if you, if you're listening as a podcast, um, but I mean, she's, you know, kind of leaning over and has this, this smile and these flush red cheeks so it's not that's why happiness is kind of a lack of vocabulary word, right? Because it's the it's a, kind of a wide like she's having some uh, pleasant kind of reaction, but the cheeks kind of suggest that it's personal, right? So it could be romantic or a little embarrassment, like something's happened she that uh, she's reacting to with kind of happiness, but a little bit of um, discomfort, not necessarily in a negative sense, but uh, the, you know, there, there's more to it than just like, um, you know, her, her brothers being amusing in front of her or something. Mm, okay. So this, you're describing this as maybe this is something, this is a kind of personal happiness, but there's something more to it than her brother being amusing. And that, that's my first question for you. Who is she staring at? And I can zoom in for you. Who is she yeah, staring at? Well, I'm just trying to see because so she has some flowers, it looks like, in her hand as her head's lying down. And so I'm I'm definitely inclined to romance. So it's, you know, um, and, and the flushed cheeks make me think it's more like it hasn't been consummated. It's somebody that like she's just starting uh to uh have emotions for or hasn't quite kind of closed the deal with her yet. And but it's, it definitely has a kind of romantic feel, um, given those factors. OK, so you're you're not you're saying it's not her mom. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, you never know with people, but the, <laughs> I, I'm assuming not. OK, so somebody that she's romantically interested in, but it hasn't been consummated yet. OK, uh, here's the next question. What had she been doing before she started looking at this person? I'm having trouble telling what she's wearing. She's just like complicated. I don't know if that's a belt or a strap or something. She's, you know, in this kind of dark room now leaning on a chair and has the flowers, which I mean, that suggests that like they were given to her. She picked them as they came inside. It wouldn't, it doesn't look like a room that's just rich with, you know, colorful objects. Um, so I feel like, you know, uh, you know, she, but it's, it doesn't have the sense exactly of like, I just came in from the sun and now I'm in my black garb and like leaning over. It's kind of like, she's there for a reason in this room for mm. a reason. And now there's kind of this touch of color, uh, given to her, um, by someone. So I, 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 I all I have, really is that she's kind of in this room um probably not expecting a lot of fun and now you know there's flowers in her hand and she's uh joyed at whatever kind of led up to that moment but i don't mm -hmm. have a clear sense got it so you're looking at the setting which is kind of dark you're looking at her clothing which is also dark and maybe she's been in here for a while she didn't just come from the beach uh and and just sat in this room and in the light and the joy is specifically from, and you're suggesting that she was given these flowers that made her light up like this. I, I mean, that's the sense that I get. And in part, I think it's, you know, she's like leaning down uh, against them and kind of looking mm. at 
whoever is uh, across the room or it's it's a little you could see it going both ways looking at whoever's across the room or she, you know her eyes are kind of upturned which can also be sort of remembering a fond moment mm-hmm. um and so it could be one of those things of i'm stuck in this room and all i can think about is that you know uh it's going to be a, a a long day until i can get back out there with with uh let's call him you know let's call him willie <laughs> a nice romantic <laughs> <Okay>. name <laughs> yeah uh, one thing don that i really like that you do as you're reading the artwork there is you're opened you opened up to other possibilities you, you had your first theory which is she's looking at someone that uh, she's romantically interested in and then you're you're thinking okay perhaps she's reflecting on a memory of hers And what I like to do is I really like to, whenever I think I know what's going on, I put a question mark at the end of it. And I think of it as when I'm reading a novel, especially like a mystery novel, and I think I know who did it towards the beginning, I'm going to put a question mark by that and wait for more evidence. The difference is it's in a novel, it's the author who gives you the more, more evidence when you're reading an artwork. It's you as you're making new discoveries or making new connections. But I do think of it as you're creating suspense for yourself as you're asking yourself what's going on. And when you're reading an artwork with other people and they're offering up their their thoughts too, you're kind of building that suspense and then thinking, okay, let's keep looking at the artwork and see where the evidence leads us. So got one more question for you. If you were to imagine her speaking, what would she say? If she were to say something right now. Would she say something like, when's dinner ready? No, it's going to be much more emotion laden. And uh, I almost feel wistful. Mm. Like, you know, I, um, this is why I'm an author instead of an improv (laughs) actor, right? (laughs) But, you know, you could just imagine something with some subtext, like, oh, what a day, like that kind of, there's feeling behind it and a kind of like airiness and openness, uh, behind the words. All right. That's wonderful. All right. Would you like to hear my reading? Absolutely. Um, So I'll share how I'm putting it together. And then about halfway through, I'll I'll share the title. Now, sometimes the title of an artwork doesn't tell us anything. Sometimes it leads us to the background story. And sometimes it gives us um, a clue. Oftentimes, titles can be, are not often made up by the uh, artists themselves. They're done by the museum or by the collector as a placeholder. Um, and I don't like giving the title first because it often um, it often spoils the the ending of the story to some extent. And this one kind of kind of does, because yeah, for me, it was one where, oh, now it all kind of seems to fit together. And I like those titles. I like a title that seems to add up everything that I've already experienced. And there sometimes our titles are like, no, that's not what this artwork is about. <laughs> So um, here's my reading. A young woman wearing black, yet rosy cheeked, sits with her head lying sideways and a smile on her face. Who is she smiling at with such radiance that her cheeks are as pink as her lips? It looks like it must be a lover to elicit such a blush. What is she doing here? Is she on a date? She does hold a small bouquet of flowers in her right hand while her left holds a long string. Maybe this is not a date. And maybe instead she's been making a bouquet of flowers. Are those two bundles of flowers beside her, red ones and white ones? If they are, she could have been picking from those stashes of st- to string flowers together. I wonder what kind of festivity she could be preparing for. At this moment, though, she stopped working, and she's lowered her head onto her propped up hands. I can see her sigh as she might be thinking to herself, 
Oh my, how do I love him? She wears a charcoal black. She wears charcoal black in this rough brown dirt colored room. But there is one small shining ornament that adorns her. One finger on her right hand extends downwards to reveal a gold and green ring. She almost seems to be subtly displaying it uh, to her companion. Whether she is staring at the man she loves or someone she wants to confide in, she, at this moment, is feeling the glow of being in love. The title of this painting is On the Eve of Her Wedding. Oh, man. What joy she's feeling as she prepares to be wed. Tomorrow, she will ten stand tall beside him. But this evening, she can let her body melt in joyous anticipation. Maybe the fact that she looks so comfortable suggests that she is with an adoring and understanding friend. It reminds me of Lydia Bennett intimately sharing her feelings of for her love with her sister Elizabeth in Pride and Prejudice. When have you felt such an unconscious, unselfconscious sense of joy? When I look at her, I don't see her in love with me. Rather, I see something almost as intimate. Her comfort to be vulnerably open about her happiness with me. And in response, I think to myself words I've often, so often said and heard, but never so much meant. I am happy for you. I'm happy for her. And I'm grateful that she confides her joy with me. You might also think of a personal connection in another way. When have you shared your happiness so openly with someone? And who in your life would you share your deepest happiness with so openly? All right. That was, that was great. I mean, that, that felt like a, a Jeffrey Deaver twist ending right there. Um, but I mean, it's, it's amazing how much even just in this brief time, you know, we, we, I was able to kind of capture that was on the right track, even not catching like, I mean, a real question sh sh was on my mind, but I didn't really pause on it, which is all right, there's a string thing. What the hell is that? That, you know, got to make sense of that. There's these other things that are colored off to the side. What are those? Um, but yeah, I mean, that's uh, incredible. So, I mean, we're at time what you read to us, tell us what book that's from and then how people can get it, learn more about what you do, all that good wrap up stuff. Yeah. So um, I'm currently finishing writing a book called Stories and Paint, uh, which is 50 artworks, 50 favorite artworks from the tours I've given over the past 15 years, including um, maybe one or two of your favorites that you experienced on that tour in Boston. And um, the idea is not to write a how-to book like Touching the Art was my first book, but this is more, here are 50 artworks just to enjoy yourself with, just to have a delicious meal, not a, a lesson on how to cook. And I'm, it's, a, it's a big coffee table book that I hope people have out that they will open up and share with each other ask each other the questions, whether you're there with your children, whether you're there with your spouse or with friends. And there are artworks that you can start to feel a bond with yourself and then invite whoever comes to see it next to, to bond with it and then to bond with them as you share answers to those personal connection questions. And um, so you can find that uh, as there's a Kickstarter going on now to raise funds. Oh, and you can pre-order the book through that Kickstarter. And if you go to the Kickstarter homepage, just search for Stories and Paint, Luke Travers, and um, you should find it. And uh, Luke will hopefully remember to email those to me so I can stick them in the show notes. Luke, it's been a real pleasure. Thanks for everything you've done over the years and uh, 
for appearing on this podcast and definitely best wishes with the new book. I think, I think of it as you get this wonderful guided tour with Luke whenever you want at your leisure and just as in his tour, you know, it's not going to have a big lecture on how to do it, but it'll give you those provoking questions so that you can really uh, begin to read art and step into the stories that are there on the canvas or in these uh, amazing sculptures. So thanks again, Luke, and hopefully we'll get to do this again sometime. I'd be very happy to, Don, and thank you and congratulations to you and your new book. And I look forward to stepping into that world. Thanks, Luke.